So, Kara, if, yes. if, if Silicon Valley is about to be pretty strongly regulated, yes. demonized, yes. you know what industry actually I know a lot about being demonized, regulated? Uh, banker? Wall Street. Yes, exactly. David All Solomon? Right. Cool, David, come on out. Come on out. Good music for you. That's Very nice. Good. So, David, just another conference introduced as a demon. I mean, yeah. So, no, you're, no, you're not, you're a demon, not but the demon now. There, there was a while in you know a decade ago. I know you were not the CEO at the time, but there was a while when people had some pretty negative things to say about Goldman Sachs, pretty negative things about Wall Street. You guys obviously survived. You're here today. Goldman Sachs is not some vestige of the past. What advice do you have for kind of Silicon Valley out there that is probably in the 2000, maybe in 2007 moment, maybe this is never going to happen, everything's going to be fine. What advice do you have for industry kind of going through its own convulsions? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. <laughs> and um, and um, I'm happy to be here. You know, finance grew a lot. We were just talking backstage how finance really grew and expanded. It was a very localized, fragmented business and really through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, finance globalized. Right. And the platforms that the big finance companies had became very large, very global, very influential, very powerful. And that, um, that brought a lot of change. Now, you know, it happened in finance, a lot of the institutions, Goldman Sachs, had been around for a long time and had morphed for a long time. Yet still, when you're going through that, you have a perception of yourself and a perception of the way you're viewed um, that's potentially different than the perception that others have as they look at you from the outside. So the first thing you have to say about what's going on in tech and with these big platforms is that they've had enormous success. They're in the position that they're in mm -hmm. because they've had enormous success. They've done a lot of things right. Um, they've, they've, they've made a difference and they've brought products and services that have mattered to people in a very expansive way, but over a relatively short period of time. And so one of the pieces of advice I would have is that you know, you've, you've got to find a way to look and listen to what others are saying and be very, very open to the fact that the way you see yourself and the way you know our community, our society, our markets, you know, see yourself might be different than the way you see yourself. And I think that's one of the mistakes that in finance we made. Certainly at Goldman Sachs, you know, we we um, we weren't as attuned to that. So self-awareness. Self-awareness. Self-reflection. Self yeah. Um, I always make the joke. Much that, better now, I hope. But. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I always say is when when you try to interview a lot of people there is a lack of self-reflection of impact. And I think last night they started to talk about that, but it's really difficult. Um, I always make the joke that um, Silicon Valley is so not self-reflective, it's a miracle they can see in mirrors. Um, it's like, you know, it's just really hard for them. When, do you think it's, it's deserved, the, the, the tech clash, or, or when you look at this? Because you're thinking about lots of things, taking these companies public, mergers and acquisitions, where finance is going. Do you think it's deserved, or what, where do you think they are in the spectrum? Well, it deserves a complicated word. As I said, these are very, very successful companies. And one of the things, when you have platforms that have a billion plus people on them, you're going to get a lot of the good in society, but also on something of that scale, you're going to see some of the bad. And it's, it's not a question of deserve. It's just, it, it's one of the functions of building a big, powerful platform that has a lot of positive impact. There are other things that come with it. And it's your job to evolve. I think one of the reasons Goldman Sachs has been around for 150 years is it's had lots of periods of time where it's faced pressure and it's found ways to evolve and become something slightly different or move in a direction that was necessary to serve its clients, its stakeholders. And you know, I think that's important for all businesses. So you have to remember, these are very young businesses. No matter what, when you look yeah. at these businesses, 20 years is a very, very short period of time in the life cycle of companies that are really going to have a lasting, you know, a lasting impact. And so I don't, I don't think about it through the lens of what's deserved. It's the reality of this is where we are. These have become very, very big businesses. They've changed the way we operate in the world. And given that, there are some positives and there are some issues that have to be dealt with. And it's their responsibility. The leaders of those organizations have to figure out both in their own actions and working collaboratively with government and. Uh, and all sorts of stakeholders, how they want to evolve their businesses. And if they do that successfully, they'll do just fine. And by the way, there'll be bumps. They'll make a lot of decisions that are right. They'll make some decisions that are wrong. They'll have to adjust. But by and large, they're really good companies, and they'll find ways to navigate. Do you think, similar to Goldman Sachs in 2007, that a company like Facebook or, or Alphabet has been too inward-looking and is not really aware of the perception 
out there of them? That's, I mean, that's not, that's not, that's for, not for me to judge. I, I can just say about Goldman Sachs as we came out of the financial crisis, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that we had to wrestle with was we had been a private partnership at a very, very private company and we went public in 1999. And so we had only really been public for about eight or nine years when the financial crisis came. We had grown, we were growing about 17% compounded a year during that period of time. So the world looked very, very different because when you're growing, you think you're doing everything right. Um, we navigated, there are certain aspects of the way we navigated risk through the financial crisis where we outperformed on a relative basis versus others. And so we kind of came out of that and we went right back to doing what we, we did, not really being tuned in and sensitive to the fact that the world had changed. Right. So, you know, for each of these companies, you can't make generalizations. Every company's got to kind of look at where it is and you've got to focus forward. You know, how do we want to evolve, you know, how we're defined, how people talk about us. And I think one of the things for sure that comes with visibility is, you know, there's good things that come with visibility and there are bad things. And you've got to have really thick skin and you can't listen to everything that's said. You've got to decide what's really important. You've got to decide what you stand for. You have to listen to the criticisms, but you can't let the criticisms define you. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think these companies will find ways to navigate this. So let's talk a little bit about, I want to get to what Goldman Sachs is doing, all the different investments you're making mm -hmm. and the shift in the financial, digital financial stuff. But first, let's stick with Silicon Valley for a minute. These IPOs, how do you assess right now? There's been some shaky IPOs, um, pretty much all of them. How do you, or do you don't think that? How do you look at the IPO market right now? We, we had Uber going out and Lyft going out. The performance has been not, not what was expected a year ago. Um, there's obviously we're waiting for Airbnb and some others to go public. How do you look at the overall landscape for tech? Uh, so look, there's, there's, there, there have been some IPOs that have underperformed expect, expectations. There are IPOs that have done very well. Pinterest, Zoom, mm -hmm. non-tech, Levi's. Right. Um, you know, the IPO market is alive and healthy. I, I think the big fundamental change with the IPO market over the course of the last decade is the real expansion of the availability of private capital. Staying public it's private too long. Well, I'm not saying that people are staying private too long. It's just private capital is available, and it's available in size. And so I used to say to people, look, we take companies public for a living, so Please we like it when up. people go public. But right. I used to say to people, there are three principal reasons why you should go public. You need capital, you need the currency, or you're fundamentally a seller, and you can't find liquidity in another venue. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a fourth reason why, and we've seen this now, that companies have taken more capital and they've gotten much larger. There is no question that there's a different kind of discipline that's applied to companies when they go through the process of going public and they have to operate in the public markets. And I'm not making a judgment that, that that's better or worse for the companies, but it's different. It's a different, it's a more structured form of discipline. And I think that's a helpful thing for companies when they get to a certain size, a certain scale. Companies are complicated. As you get bigger, you're taking lots of capital. As you get global, it's hard to manage these businesses. And public company structures add discipline you know, to that process. And I think there's a benefit to that. So I wouldn't say that these companies have stayed private too long or not. But I, I do think that there's an evolution in all this. And there's been a lot of capital available. And candidly, if I was running one of these companies and there was a lot of capital available, I'm not sure I would have handled it any differently. Mm -hmm. When you look at a handful of the companies that have not performed to expectation, I just say as someone who's taken a lot of companies public, and there was a point in my career where I ran that business for, for Goldman Sachs, um, one of the hardest things to do is take a company public where the expectation of how that company is going to do in an IPO is different than the reality at the time that you're going public. It's very, very hard, and those tend to disappoint. Right. So if you go back and you look historically, three companies where there was very, very high expectations in their IPO, Google, Facebook, Uber, mm -hmm. and all three were IPOs that initially, you know, in the months right after the IPO, all were considered as not having performed as expected. Sure, but this, kind of, this all gets kind of fueled to the idea, which uh, has circulated in Silicon Valley for, you know, five years of the 10-year bull market, that Silicon Valley is in a financial bubble. Um, there's this, you know, quote, that, and I'm sure you know from Chuck Prince, right before the financial crisis, you know, when the music stops playing, things will get complicated, uh, but for now, the music's playing, so you gotta dance. I remember that quote. You remember that quote. <laughs> to what extent do you feel like people are, are dancing too much, so to speak, in Silicon Valley? How worried are you about a bubble? S uh, uh, Silicon Valley is a reflection of what's going on with capital and money all over the world. We, we have the most extraordinary 
push of monetary policy in the history of the world. And with interest rates basically zero all over the world, it's not surprising that people move out on the risk curve and people look for more risk assets. So you, don't so, see, you don't see it as a Silicon Valley specific problem. I, 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 I think that people are looking, they're looking for returns in an environment where riskless returns are basically zero or negative, you know, even in a lot of places. And so I think there are places where people are out the risk curve in Silicon Valley and places where they're not. Um, but, um, but I think all of this is a function of the fact that we've been through a long cycle of risk on. Now, you know, bubbles, you know, you think all different things about bubble. This is not, this is not 1999, 2000. Um, this is different for a lot of reasons. But do I think that generally speaking, investors are willing to pay more for the potential for growth now than they might be at a different period of time? Yes. People are assuming in a lot of these companies, it's not that they're not good companies, we're talking strictly about valuation, that the growth trajectory over the next five years and the execution of all the things they're saying they're going to do is going to go off flawlessly. And some will, some won't. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think about that as a bubble. I just think that people are further out on the risk curve um, than they've been at other points. Well, let's talk about a specific company. You just m mentioned them. Facebook and Google had since done well. And you mentioned Uber is the third one, which has not, has been more disappointing to investors. They did have a great run up for a long time and they did have tons of cash from all over the place. There was tons of availability of capital for them. Um, assess where the, how DAR is doing and where, they, where that changes. Because I think a lot of people feel this is a business that can't, that was over over-indexed, essentially. Look, look, I... And you guys were an investor. We're, we've been an investor. So one of the things I was going to say to you, say that, you know, Uber is one that hasn't done well. We've been an investor in Uber for a long time. Yeah, we've if done you got very it. Well. Yeah, but right. from 2015, so, if you didn't... But that's, maybe that's the lens that we should be looking through. Yes. Okay, okay, the fact that for five minutes in time, Uber went public and it's trading a little bit below its IPO. What I think Dara is focused on appropriately is how he's going to build value in this company, you know, over the course of the next five years. And, you know, he inherited... He stepped into, you know, a very, very complicated platform a nice and a very, plan. very, yeah. and a very, very young company yeah. and a very, very young company um, where there was a lot of change. He stepped in with no chief financial officer. He, you know, he stepped in with a lot of senior leadership that he needed to hire. He stepped in with multiple platforms and multiple investments, some of which he's keeping, some of which he's made decisions, you know, to de-emphasize or not to allocate capital to. So the, you know, the test in all these things is how you do over time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is an incredible platform. It's built a very big brand in a very short period of time. It's got its hands in a lot of different businesses. Um, and the execution risk will now be seen. You know, can they execute on a lot of this? And can they, can they grow the business? Can they create paths to profitability in these different platforms? And if so, it's going to be a monster business. If not, it'll be a big business. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm watching with everybody else. We're a shareholder. I'm a personal shareholder. Um, is and an so, angel uh, investment, or I'm sorry. You have an angel investment. I am. Um, I I was in I was in some venture funds that were in very very early. The firm also made some news. A, a few years ago, the firm sold to uh, sold the security to um, to private wealth clients to to private wealth clients that was a convertible security, where you earned you earned a, a very small interest rate, but you are principal converted into shares at a discount to the IPO price, and that discount was bigger the longer it took. Mm -hmm. for them to go public. And I bought some of that security because at the time they were raising money privately yep. at a very high valuation given what they were doing and on what autonomous and other things. It was clear they were going to keep raising equity. And this was basically a way of presenting, preventing yourself from being diluted, hmm. you know, as they, as they made the path to the IPO. It turned out to be a terrific, uh, a terrific security. What about M&A? Talk about that because one of the most, there hasn't been a lot of M&A, although the big, it's the bigger companies. There just was one, I shouldn't say that, there was one Salesforce. Just Salesforce bought, yesterday. Uh, just bought a con Tableau. 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 Um, that used to be a very big market for you all, for your business. How do you look at the M&A market? It's, it, it's, 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 it's one of the cornerstone businesses that we're in. We advise companies on strategic activities. Uh, you know, we advised Tableau yesterday and it's, and it's sale to Salesforce. Uh, you know, yesterday morning you also saw this Raytheon, you know, UTX transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think strategic activity continues to be very high. CEOs are engaged. And if you step back and you, you think about the mindset of most CEOs across lots of industries, mm -hmm. you've got to find ways to drive growth. Mm -hmm. And so there hasn't been as much, there's been some, but there hasn't been as much M&A 
in the tech space there because there's been a lot of growth. And so mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're CEO and you're operating where your business or your platform or whatever you're doing is, is, is creating organic growth, there's not a lot of reason to think about doing things strategically. But if you're operating in, in other parts of the economy where the growth is more GDP or a trend and you have to figure out how to accelerate or strengthen your position, um, it's a big part of the dialogue. Scale matters. One of the reasons scale matters is because there are very few businesses that don't use technology to sell their products, connect with their clients or customers, manufacture what they mm -hmm. do, and the dollars needed to invest in tech platforms in almost any business requires scale. They're significant. And so M&A is a way of people creating scale to protect their position. And so I think you'll continue to see you know, meaningful activity when- If they're allowed to. I'm sorry? If they're allowed to. Well, I, I think generally- I can't I, think of a thing that government will let Google or Facebook buy at this well, point. Well, I, I think you're looking at two companies that you just mentioned at a moment in time. And they have a lot of money. And you're asking me broadly about the broad M&A yeah. market, which last year was $4 trillion. Right, right. right. So, I mean, it's, I'm making a comment that I think that's going to continue to be a part of our of other economic ecosystem. Right. Um, you know, I think that, that when you look at, you know, large cap tech, it's going to be trickier at this moment in time. Let's talk about, let's talk about your business. Um, you guys have made a big push into Marcus, uh, which is your kind of consumer facing uh, brand for banking. Um, JP Morgan recently announced that they're sort of, not exactly the same thing, but a digital brand, uh, digital native app, Finn, they were closing that down. There are a lot of companies in Silicon Valley, Robinhood, SoFi we're having on the stage later today, everything from Square, that are sort of consumer facing at their core. These are things with product and design, you know, I know you, this, you guys are a Wall Street company that is doing, the Wall Street institution, doing things in tech. To what extent do you feel like consumer banking is just too crowded for markets to succeed? I know you said last week that investors would be throwing money at it if it was a private company, right? Well, we're, we're very proud of what we've accomplished in building out a consumer platform. We, as you point out, we haven't been in consumer businesses. Mm -hmm. The variety, and this gets to the evolution point, there are a variety of reasons as to how the world evolved where we decided that we needed to start to find a way to move in the direction of consumer businesses. We thought that there was an opportunity to deliver a different kind of product and service that helped consumers manage their financial affairs in a much more integrated way with a lot less friction. You know, J.P. Morgan Chase is a huge, Chase is a huge consumer franchise. Um, they're gonna continue to be a huge consumer franchise. We think there are opportunities to use a digital platform in a different way. And in a small number, two and a half years, two and a half, three years, we've got four million customers. We've brought in $45 billion of digital deposits into the firm, and that's still growing, and that's very important. You know, that's very important for us. And the feedback we get from clients on the services we're providing on the platform is very, very good. J.D. Power just gave us an award as the number one firm in consumer loans from a customer service perspective, you, 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 which is which is for a business that's a couple of years old, that's you know that's that's good progress. So I think there's an opportunity for a lot of people to provide products and services that take friction out of how we manage our money. And I think we're off to a good start, but we're building something for the next 20 the years. Same thing with credit card. Okay. Uh, the credit card is in addition to that. You know, we've talk we've, a little bit about how we've, we've announced about. we've announced this partnership with Apple, and the card is in beta. It's, it's being tested. There are hand there. Are, bunch of employees at Goldman Sachs and a bunch of employees at Apple that have it. I will tell you that my experience with it so far is that it's easy to use. There's less friction. The information at your disposal is terrific. It will launch, uh, you know, by the end of the summer. And, you I know, we're excited about it. how it came out. You just said, I think we'll... I'm sorry? How did it come about? Talk about this. Well, it, what, what came about from, from our perspective, you know, we have been thinking about building an integrated digital platform. We started with deposits and unsecured loans. But our vision was always that the opportunity to put onto a digital platform everything that people need in a very integrated, seamless way. So you need to spend, you need to borrow, you need to save, you need to invest, you need to insure and protect, you need credit card functionality, you need all these products and you want to integrate them. When you start with a white sheet of paper, you can build a much better model for how people can manage their financial affairs digitally. And so we started. And so it was a natural progression to think about a credit card we have the benefit of having relationships with a lot of these companies. They have big customer bases. And we have the advantage, unlike others that are in the credit card business, that we, we didn't have a historical business. So we built a platform for scratch. It's the first credit card platform to be built in the last 20 and years. why Apple? What was because of the... We, we have a long historical relationship with Apple. We're very close to Apple. They were, they were thinking about the business at a time that we were thinking about it. 
Um, they spoke to a number of firms, and we found the kind of our vision and their vision. There was a lot of overlap in that. And right. so we, we went down the road. And look, with partnerships, they can always be complicated, but we've, we've got a long history, and we're very optimistic that the partnership will do something that's, that's neat. I want to ask you about brand. Obviously, you guys were talking backstage. You're, you're competing these days for talent with Peloton, Slack, maybe even Juul, an engineer who's thinking about going to any of these places. It's interesting that you guys brand Marcus as Marcus by Goldman Sachs. To me, that means you think that Goldman Sachs among millennials still has some cool. How sure are you that that's true among He's asking if you're cool. Uh, well, well, I'm, I'm definitely not cool. So, I mean, I'm, I, there's no question about that. Look, I, the, answer, the answer to that is we're trying to figure it out. You know, so here's this company that's been around for 150 years. In any brand survey, it certainly has a very aspirational brand. That doesn't mean it's perfect and there are no detractors to the brand, but it's a pretty powerful brand. But we were entering consumer businesses, and we decided to do it under a different banner. Now, over time, you know, who knows where that will go? You right. know, over the next 20, 30 years, as we build, we build a platform, it might be that we wind up with just one brand, Goldman Sachs. It might be that we wind up with, with multiple brands because you can segment. You know, we have a private wealth business for, you know, for ultra private wealth that is Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, as we, as we build other businesses, you know, we'll have to see. But the, the answer is we're thinking about that. And we actually have, with individuals, we have three brands at the moment. We have Goldman Sachs, yeah. we have ACO, which is basically a corporate counseling wealth management brand where through corporations, you know, for corporate employees, um, we help them with wealth management, finances, taxes, you know, those kinds of things. And that's a company that's been around that we bought about 15 years ago. And that's a real brand, and that brand has right. resonance. And then we've got Marcus, so but you, I mean, to see. Don't you, I mean, this, this is part of a broader push by you internally uh, to kind of make the, the, this sort of stodgy Wall Street institution more relatable, right? I mean, you've done things like relax the dress code. You've done things like make sure there's uh, rules governing work on weekends. Do you, I mean, do you feel like that's like a legacy item for you to make this, you know, somewhat, you know, most, most people don't have touch points with Goldman Sachs. Most people think of it as just part of the Wall Street firmament. You want this to be internally something that people can say, hey, I work Goldman Sachs, and that is seen as a positive, cool thing to be doing in the world. Well, you're, 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 you're touching it to something that's very important to us. We're a talent organization. Uh, you know, we have platforms and different kinds of businesses, but we are a talent organization. We're a professional services organization. And so attracting and developing talent is a huge part of what makes the place tick. And, and, you're, and you're aware of the perception of what Goldman Sachs I, is. I'm aware of all the different perceptions of, of what Goldman Sachs is. And one of the things that I'm also aware of is that 74% of our employee base is millennial or Gen Z. 60% of our employee base is 30 years old or less. And so, you know, the world's just more competitive than when I started 35 years ago. And you've got to be relatable. So when you think you're talking about dress, how people work, et cetera, we're very fortunate that, that Goldman Sachs is one of, you know, the top five or ten places that when people are coming out of undergraduate school, they want to go start a career, get some training, get some skills, meet people, network. You know, we compete, you know, very, very well. We hire about 2,500 people out of school a year. We get tens and tens of thousands of applications for, for you know, for those, for those jobs. It's a very desirable place to start a career. To attract people mid-career, we have 11,000 engineers at Goldman Sachs. We compete with all the big tech platforms for engineers. We have to be a relatable organization. We've got to be a little bit more human than the way that and the organization the, was defined. And so we've been thinking about that. Is that the same thing when you're thinking about IPOs and attracting companies? As you know, you have Slack doing its thing. Everyone's. How do you look at those efforts not to be involved in, in the typical roadshow atmosphere? Well, the, there direct, are direct listings. Yeah. Direct listening. So look, there, there's, there's been one direct listing, and now there's going to be a second. Um, we've worked on both those direct listings and an advisor. I mean, people come to us given you know our experience around these things. I, you know, their direct listing is not for everyone. You know, for starters, the primary reason people go do an IPO is they want to raise some capital, mm -hmm. and so you know, a direct listing, you know, doesn't solve that doesn't solve that problem. You know, Spotify was a very visible branded platform. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch, you know, Slack the next one. I think there'll be some direct listings, but I don't I don't think we're gonna wake up tomorrow and, and have the whole IPO process shift in this direction. And then the long term stock exchange with Eric here. How do you look at that, those I you know I I met with I met with Eric um, it was a while ago when he was first getting started. Probably I, when you didn't think it was gonna happen. No, I actually I actually thought it was I actually thought he was a super, super smart guy and I thought it was super, super interesting. Um, 
it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this all evolves. I think there's going to be a lot of disruption around equity platforms, exchanges, liquidity. Um, this is an area, and, and look, we're a big, big player in it, but we also see the disruption coming in a lot of different directions. So it's definitely a space where there's, there's going to be an evolution over the next decade as to how that works. But scale, global, connectivity to the pipe that the clients right. want to be connected into, those things are super, super important. Just one final thing before folks uh, line up for questions. China, um, there's a growing, maybe somewhat bipartisan consensus that China is not as much of a friend to the U.S. as we've thought for the last, you know, a lot, really since, the, you know, for the last 20 years. I'm wondering, do you think of your obligations ultimately as to just Goldman Sachs shareholders, or do you feel any obligation to the U.S. specifically at a time when there's kind of this rising tensions between the two nations? Oh, we, we, we feel an obligation to a lot of stakeholders. Um, certainly, you know, our country is, is, is an important stakeholder. And, you know, I feel strongly, I would side on the fact that, that we had a foreign policy initiative over the last, you know, 30, 40 years that led us in a direction with China and has led to a bunch of imbalances. I look, I look for ourselves, you know, we've had a joint venture there that we've wanted to control for 15 years and we've been told that we'd be able to make progress and move toward having economic control of that joint venture and it hasn't happened. In other words, we've, it's, not, it's not a level playing field with respect to the way we operate there or someone you know, from there can come, can come right. operate here. And I think that's gotta be, I think that's gotta be rebalanced. I think it's gonna be a long, arduous process. It's not just about trade. Um, it's not just gonna get solved in the short term. I think that there are some disagreements that we in China have. And when we've had China's a rising power, we were a power, we are a power, and we were a power that used to have 50% of global GDP. We now have 20% of global GDP. The last time we dealt with a rising power, if you go back and you look at Russia, mm -hmm. we weren't economically entwined and you know, entangled with them so we could isolate them. Right. We don't really have a good roadmap for dealing with a rising economic power that's a very, very significant What, what are your power. thoughts on the trade, the tariff, I'm the, sorry? what President Trump is doing? Um, I, you know, I would side with most people that generally speaking, you know, tariffs aren't, um, aren't productive economically for our economy. I do think that we have to find ways to pressure China. And, you know, I haven't come up with necessarily a better way to do that. I think the thing that becomes complicated is we've got a lot of skirmishes going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the big skirmish is over in that direction. And I think the more we can focus, you know, on that, the better chance we have of bringing others along and possibly making more progress and moving forward. Okay, questions from the audience? Right here. Is there a name, where are you from? Hi there. Sure. Uh, go, go first and then there, go ahead. So, uh, hi, Crawford Delpret from uh, IDC. I have a question for you in the sense of, you touched on this briefly, but think about the number of public companies. So if you go back to 97, we had about 7,000 public companies. Today we have between 3,500 and 4,000. Can you just sort of look out for us and kind of, what does the public company world look like five years from now, just from the sense of you've got this concentration and this smaller number? And you talked about why companies go public, but it just seems like the theater for how we're going to be investing in public companies is just by definition going to change going forward. I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's look, it's, you know, five years is a short period of time. But I, I, you know, I think as you look forward, here's what's fundamentally changed. If you go back when I started my career in the, you know, in the early 80s, if you were a small company and you, you needed capital, there was only one place you could really turn, the public markets. I mean, there was early stage venture and then there were the public markets. So you had, you know, companies going public raising $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, Given the concentration of institutional capital and how important that is to the public marketplace, there's no market for companies like that you know, anymore. So companies have to have scale and market cap to have liquidity. Um, and in that context, you know, that delays you know, the process of when companies can go public. So you know, I think the chance of us going back to seven, 8,000 US public companies is, is low. You know, I do think things can ebb and flow a little bit from here. I do think we've been in a period of time where private capital has been abundant in a different environment. Private capital might not be quite as abundant. I mean, I know it's hard for anybody to imagine, but if we were in an environment where there was a 6% U.S. Treasury, there wouldn't be so much private capital available. My guess is one day we'll wake up, there will be a 6% U.S. Treasury again. So, you know, these things can ebb and flow. 
Um, but I think that that capital formation has just become a lot easier privately, and that will continue to keep people out of the public markets until they really need to go, and they'll generally be larger companies. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, very quick, one more question. Sorry, we're trying to keep on time today. I know we didn't yesterday. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, Pam Dillon, uh, Ring at B2B Software. David, my question has to do with the public and private markets again. You were discussing all the reasons that someone would want to go public. Of course, there are reasons that someone would not want to go public. Goldman is equally powerful in the private markets. Can you talk about the financial disciplines that are developing there, the reasons that CEOs might find and face similar disciplines, financial disciplines that the public markets up until now were really responsible for? So, um, you know, we spend a lot of time on that broadly, but I think that, I think, I think one of the big reasons people don't want to go public, and I think it's a good reason, is, is the public markets do push more short-termism on performance. And that has an effect on investment decisions, and that has an effect on how you manage the business. Um, at the same point, that short-termism creates a discipline around capital allocation that, that is just different than what you get in a private company structure. Um, one of the things that I think will be interesting to watch, and it's not going to happen with smaller businesses, but when you start raising billions of dollars of private capital at $10 billion plus of valuation, the capital sources are off, often investors that are generally structured to be public company investors. So you're taking mutual fund money, or you're taking pension money, you know, it's, 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 you're taking money that normally is used to certain kind of reporting protections, information protections that you're not getting in the private markets. And I do think there's a risk that we could see, you know, over time, I don't think this is a pressing issue now, but over time we could see more regulation that leads to different barometers or standards for what you have to do. So the public company standard could get translated instead of in, you know, black or white line, public or private, it could get translated into size, capital raised, mm -hmm. investor bases, et cetera. And so that would be something that I think you could see transition. But you know, generally speaking, I'm not, I'm not religious, you know, public, private. There are benefits to both. There are differences in the way companies should be managed. I think one of the things that companies and boards and the investors that back them need to do is you need to understand that company, its motivation, its objectives, and under what structure do you have the best chance of making that company successful over time. And it's different for different businesses. One, one last thing, um, diversity. Uh, Goldman Sachs never had a female CEO. Um, I know that it's very important to you. When you one of your first things when you showed up there, you have a 33 person management committee, went from three women to seven. Pretty good. Is that fast enough? It's it's not fast enough. And I'm you know, I'm spending a lot of time on this and I've I've been out publicly setting aspirational goals for the organization and trying to create more concrete accountability in the organization for moving faster. I, I think that we've, we've made progress, but it's not as much as I'd like us to make. Um, there are things that we're trying to do that are more specific and more proactive to move along. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to change the lens of the filter. So, for example, just using your management committee example, certain jobs at the firm have put people on the management committee. And I just said, you know what, we're not going to wait anymore. You know, who are the three or four most important women in the firm who aren't on the management committee, regardless of what job they sit in? We're putting them on the management even, committee. Even if their title didn't correspond. Even if their title didn't correspond with what the historical practice had been. So new lens. And I think, look, these are the things that, that you have to try to do. There are some things that are, that are broad accountability and metrics and process. And there are other things where leadership has got to start at the top has to say, you have to see every day that I care about this and I will move the organization forward and hopefully you make some progress and you get the organization to follow some more. But I, we have to make, and it's not just we, corporate, the corporate world, public, private, has to make more progress on diversity and inclusion. It's a business necessity and it's right. All right, David Solomon, thank you.